Everybody, it's Jeff Antoniak. Welcome to Guided Listening. This is the last Guided Listening video Aww. of the year. It's the Friday before New Year's Eve 2023. I know people are going to be seeing this years in the future, but Happy New Year, whatever uh, day or month or week you're in right now. Um, it has been a great year. Um, Jazzwire is doing so well. We have the Summer Summit and the Winter, the Jazzwire Winter Summit, which we always do online. That's coming up four weeks from now. So I hope, go to the website and I hope we will have some of you with us. We have a handful of spots. We only open this up to 21 people who want to do some in-depth work. Since it's online, we can do it with people all around the world. And yes, we figured out how to do this online. There is a ton of playing, a ton of playing back and forth with me, interacting with the rest of the faculty. It's a blast. It's very powerful. So I hope you uh, get involved with that. And um, I looked at my uh, YouTube stats, which I pretty much almost never do. I think the last time I looked was a year ago. Uh, we have over 3 million views between YouTube and Facebook for this channel. So thank you, 3 million views. So that could be one person who likes jazz a lot. Um, it could be 3 million, you know, but uh, the fact that it's 3 million views and I'm nowhere near the top, you know, whoever the top person that gets all the views, whatever. The point is, People love jazz. People want to know about this stuff. We want to understand it deeper. And anyone who's that involved wanting to understand this deeper is almost certainly a player or used to be a player, right? It's, uh, it, it's always mind-blowing to me, people that know a lot about jazz but never played an instrument. But of course, that happens. This is wonderful music. But for those of you who are players, you maybe are stalled out. Maybe you haven't played your instrument in 30 years and you're considering getting back to it, but how do I start Jazzwire? Take the free trial, everybody. We have a lot of cool news coming for Jazzwire in 2024. I'll be telling you about it. I'll be here every Friday for you. So let's dig into this. We're going to talk today about all blues from the legendary Miles Davis album, uh, Kind of Blue. So we're going to dig into this thing. Uh, there are some things going on here that I'm going to say three quarters of jazz musicians are unaware of. I'm talking about pros, all the pros you go listen to. I'm going to say nine out of 10 of them don't play the song the way it is on the album. There's this cool thing that happens that nine out of 10, probably more pros, forgot about, never knew in the first place. There are some interludes in this blues. So all blues is a blues. It's in G concert. It's a 12 measure blues. It's in 6-8. I've seen it written in 3-4. I've seen it written in 4-4. Four, four. I've seen it written in 6-8. 6-8 makes the most sense to me. It's, you know, 6-8 is just two groups of three, right? So I think writing it in 6-8 makes the most sense notation-wise. That's something we don't need to argue over, right? We're just going to learn the tune and play the tune the way it sounds right. So there's some cool things going on here. I'll just point out very quickly before we jump in. There's a set recurring bass line which is very atypical for jazz songs. So unless you're playing a boogaloo, or a funk tune, or some you know special post-bop kind of tune with composed bass lines. This is rare. So we've got this cool uh, written out bass line. Now, the thing that I was talking about before that a lot of people just gloss over, aren't aware of, and it's a drag that gets left out of a lot of performances because it adds a lot of vibe, is there is a four measure interlude um, after the head, between the solos, before the last head. And that interlude, not necessarily ne necessary in the blues, can't really think of too many other blues that have an interlude. One or two, maybe Gingerbread Boy comes to mind. There's probably others, but not too many. So this idea of the interlude, so I'm gonna be pointing that out to you. And then we have Miles, we have Bill Evans, we have John Coltrane, we have uh, Cannonball soloing. So these four really, really different voices. Uh, this will be a blast to listen to with you, and I hope I'm going to point out some things that in the 500 times you've heard this song, you're going to hear some different things. Here we go. So we can hear that recurring bass line. Boom. Ba -doo -doo. Ba -doo -doo. Right? That's recurring. The rolling piano chords. That's interesting. We don't hear that in jazz terribly much. And then Cannibal and Coltrane playing this background line. And there's our melody. 
still with the bass line and the rolling chords. It makes it sound different than any other blues you've ever heard. Plus, it's in six. Totally different, right? Big deal, that's a big deal. And at this point, the bass leaves that bass line for two measures. Here's the end of the form and top, except it's not the top. Four measure interlude before we play the melody a second time. Big deal. Here's the melody. And now this melody, it's a sketch of a melody. Miles plays it a little different every time. There's definitely a shape to it. There are definitely things he plays the same, but there are a lot of things he is improvising in the melody. This is our turnaround in the blues. Here's the end of the form. One, two, three, one, two, three, and. And here is our interlude again. This is now the third time. It was an intro. It was between the first two heads of the chorus. Now it's before the solo. So now the drums has gone to sticks. So again, different feel than we had. Same bass line though, right? That recurring bass line. And the rolling chords on the piano has gone away. So there's definitely a different feel here than there was on the melody. And all these long notes in Miles' solo. But when we listen in, there's all these short, popping, swinging things he plays. So all these long notes that would be atypical for a bebop musician or someone who helped invent bebop. It's a different style of playing. Do we call it melodic? Do we call it romantic? It's Miles. <laughs> but do that, how, how pompin' and swinging those rhythms are. And then how he puts it against these long notes. It's, it's uh, really personal. It's very personal in that most other players aren't gonna play this way. If this was Kenny Dorham, if this was Dizzy, if this was Freddie Hubbard, Different voices, right? Still that bass line, by the way. So listen to the bass line, one chord. Still the one chord. Still the one chord. Here comes the four chord. Oh, so the bass didn't transpose the bass line when it went to the four chord. So if you're a bass player and you've been doing that, uh-uh. So it's interesting that this bass line stays based on the G, on the G7. When the chord goes to the C7, the bass line doesn't move to C like every other bass line in the world. It stays on G, so it's like a pedal sound underneath the four chord. Amazing. Cannibal. Now he's used uses some long notes in the sense that there will be a quarter note, a half note. The way he's articulating, to me that's the great, the great thing. One of the 400 great things about Cannibal is that precise, pumping articulation he does and how personal it is. Second time I've used that word personal, I guess. So some real great blues language there. Bebop, right? Double time. Cannibal is coming from that bebop, gospel, soul kind of thing. So he was fantastic at mixing those blues inflections in with some of the deepest bebop lines you can imagine. So we still have that bass line going on. Maybe let's tune into Bill Evans comping a bit here. Ooh, da, da, da. 
Uh, so he's still hinting at the underpinnings of the song. What Cannonball and Coltrane were doing at the beginning, that rhythm and those ascending, descending voicings, Bill Evans has that in his comping a lot on this too. He's playing it overtly there. So that's a fascinating decision that we're, what, four or five minutes into this tune and Bill Evans is still using elements from the melody. On the bass, we're still using the bass line. He has yet to change that bass line. I'm gonna guess Miles said something, like this is what we're gonna do on this tune. Here's our interlude, by the way. So we didn't go right into Coltrane solo, four measure interlude. That's important when we play this song. Now listen to Train solo. Does it sound more minor? Does it sound darker than Cannonball? I'm putting words in your head, but does it sound different? It's personal, right? It's a different voice. What's he doing? Is he just playing G minor, whereas Cannonball was playing G dominant? That's not it. It's not what he's doing. Come inside Jazzwire, we talk about what he's doing here, how he's getting this sound. One quick way I'll put it is he's avoiding the thirds. On the G7 chord, he doesn't play a lot of Bs. When it goes to the C7 chord, he doesn't play a lot of Es. Hannibal was doing that, playing a lot of thirds. And now it's getting a little happier sounding. What does that mean? Or a little brighter or a little less dark or whatever. He's playing major thirds. But he wasn't playing minor thirds before. He was avoiding the third. How do we do that? I'd love to talk to you about it. And that bass line still going on and it really adds this cool lilt to it. We could be walking and swinging by now, but no. So if you're a drummer, listen to the ride cymbal. What is the pattern that he's using or what are some of the patterns? Dang to dang, dang, dang to dang, dang, dang to dang, dang. So that's one of them, this sort of three or six pattern. By the way, here's our interlude. Woo, all that space and beginning with that kind of little blues sort of sound. And how, the, how his right hand is talking to his left hand, right? They're, he's sort of taking turns. They're talking to each other a little bit here as he starts out. It's not just the melody in the right hand, I'm gonna play chords in the left hand. And now, locking the hands together a little bit. Still going with that sound. What a wonderful sound that guitar players and especially piano players can do. So as a piano player, we could be thinking about Red Garland or George Shearing, so many great piano players that came before that were expert at that style. Here, so that was the end of the piano solo. Here's our interlude. And what's gonna come next? I'm guessing the melody. It did. So Bill Evans' solo, it wasn't like it had this great arc or he played all kinds of fast stuff. It was very impressionistic. It was a vibe, but it wasn't like there were all these great licks that we're gonna transcribe. There were fantastic things that we could learn, but you get what I'm saying, right? It was a, sort of a non-solo in a way. Interesting, interesting decision, because Bill Evans could blast with the greatest of them. That decision, why did he play that way? Cool. Interlude. So the interlude happens between every part of the song. We play the melody, then the interlude. Melody, then the interlude. 
alto solo interlude, tenor solo interlude, end of the tenor solo interlude before the melody. And listen to the comping as related to the sax playing. We can't, so the, it, the comping seems to be doing that roll again in the background. The important thing is the sax players are comping. They're doing the comping thing. So in a way, Bill Evans roll, yeah, yeah, he's rolling in the back. So Bill Evans role of being the guy to comp the chords in a way was taken away. Or if he comped, he would have gotten in the way. Oh, what's going on here? He would have gotten in the way of the sax players. So is this a vamp at the end? One chord. So we're still in the blues. So we're on a four chord. So we're in a chorus here. So he's already played the melody out twice. And so this is like an extra thing at the end. So yeah, that th was a full chorus of not the melody, but just kind of miles blowing over it. All right, so interesting end of the tune where they play the melody out interlude, melody out, and then there was a whole other chorus. So most of us playing this professionally, we play the melody out and then we just sort of hang out on the G chord, on the tonic chord. Maybe we cue the turnaround at some point to end the song, or maybe we just vamp out on uh, the bass line. So if you're a bass player, first off, learn this bass line, and no, you're not better than Paul Chambers. Your decisions probably aren't better than Miles Davis. So that idea of like, yeah, how about just play that bass line all the way through this tune. Sure, it's fun to get swinging in six and all that kind of stuff, but um, what gives this song the mood? What gave the album, Kind of Blue, that mood? What made it one of the best-selling records, the best-selling jazz record of all time? The mood that everything had. So it's not just about G7 chords and what's a great walking bass line or what's a great voicing. Um, it's sort of about that mood. When we call this tune, it should be because we have a vibe in mind that we want to put out to the room and the audience. So that's kind of a cool way to think about it. Think about those four solos, Miles' solo that had so many long notes, but then he would connect to the rhythm and the time in a huge way. And he knew when to kick it ahead and when to play that way. Cannibal comes in with a ton of notes, playing a lot of bebop, frankly. Incredible. Then Coltrane comes in with that sort of, I, I, I use the words heavier and darker, neither in a, a disparaging way, but his tonality and his feel and the weight of what he's playing feels different than Cannibal. Yeah, he's playing a bigger horn and all that, but that ain't it. It's his harmonic approach. And then Bill Evans is sort of non-solo solo, and again, not in a disparaging way, but in a very cool, like hipster, impressionistic, I don't have much to say to you, man. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just going to be over here. And he plays all this incredible stuff. So it, it's fascinating, right? So those personalities. And of course, Miles Davis was great at finding these really different personalities that would challenge and bring out the best in each other. But Cannibal didn't try to sound like Coltrane. Train didn't try to sound like Cannibal right? Like Bill Evans wasn't really trying to sound like Wynton Kelly, although all these folks, you know, had to have respected each other. Um, but they pushed each other forward because of those individual voices. That's, that's such a cool thing to think about when we listen to these recordings. And again, those decisions about Bill Evans rolling chords. It's not really a Bill Evans thing that we hear, you know, 50 other times in his recordings. Um, Paul Chambers playing that repeated bass line. That's not a PC thing, uh, you know, that happened all the time. So I'm, I'm really fascinated when I hear atypical approaches to a song or why didn't the bass walk? And I want to know, was there a conversation? There was almost certainly a conversation about that. I wonder if they tried uh, it walking. And I know there's a couple books about uh, this whole session that were written. I actually read one, maybe both of them. Can't remember a thing from the book. Um, but it was good. Um, so yeah, maybe those things are answered in the book. Uh, I don't know that they were, but uh, that is a cool way for an educated musician like you and me to be listening to this stuff, to be listening in, listening deeper, asking those questions. Yeah, we should listen to this stuff to be inspired and to enjoy it, but I'm a pro, like I'm trying to get better. Um, I'm not waiting for osmosis, I practice. 
um, I spend time consciously listening to things because I got a gig tonight and I want to sound better. So that's how I move ahead. So if that sounds a little bit like you or if that attitude sounds like something you'd like to cultivate in yourself in 2024, I would love to work with you. I'd love for you to work with the rest of the faculty at Jazzwire, and I would love to see you at the Winter Summit, which would be a great way for us to get working together, talking for three days straight, and uh, really making a plan for you. So a lot for you to get involved with. I really appreciate uh, you contributing to these three million views that we've had uh, over the lifetime of this channel, and uh, I will see you here next week. Have a great one.